Elizabeth Hesselblad grew up in difficult circumstances. Her father was an unsuccessful shop owner and at the age of 16 she had to work as a maid to support the family. Two years later she immigrated to the United States as over 300,000 Swedes did during the 1880s to seek opportunity. A pious Lutheran, Elizabeth wrote in her memoirs that it troubled her that many of her friends went to other Protestant churches. I began to wonder which was the real true fault because I had read in my New Testament that there should be one shepherd and one fold. I often pray to be guided to this one fold and remember especially on one occasion when walking under the big pine trees in my native land, how I looked up into the sky and said, Dear Father in heaven, show me where is the one fold that you want us all to be in. I felt a wonderful peace coming into my soul, and there seemed to be a voice that answered, Yes, my child, one day I will show you. In 1888, Elizabeth boarded the steamer Servia in third class on her way to New York. On deck there were no chairs, so people were standing and lying all over the floor as they were not allowed to stay in their cabins during the day. Sometimes the waves were so large that the salty water spilled onto the deck of the ship. Already after one hour in New York, Elizabeth found a job with a family in White Plains, 30 miles north of downtown Manhattan. She had to rise five in the morning and work until eight in the evening. She did not understand much English, and when she said something in Swedish, they couldn't help laughing. In her many letters home to her family, she reported her loneliness until she returned to New York to a better position with a family west of Central Park and closer to the Swedish community. After a year, Elizabeth had difficulty eating, endured severe stomach aches and finally starting to bleed so much that she had to be rushed in a horse-pulled ambulance to Roosevelt Hospital. But in the midst of this trial, Elizabeth drew closer to God. I was very weak, felt very lonely and wept bitterly finding myself in the big hospital ward, far away from my home and my native land. At midnight an old nurse, a widow called Miss Murphy, came to my bed and pulled off the bandage, and with it my skin, leaving me in my weak state holding the bedclothes away from the bleeding flesh. And so I remained until seven the following morning. God permitted that I should be forgotten and thus learn to suffer. My soul turned to him as never before and I prayed, Dear Lord, if you make me well enough, I will dedicate my life to your poor and never shall anyone you send me to take care of be left like this. After her recovery, Elizabeth trained to become a nurse which strongly influenced her search for the true fold. In the multi-ethnic milieu of New York, she did not feel that she belonged to any particular church. She met people from various Protestant groups, Catholics, Jews and those with no faith. She went to different churches and even synagogues looking for an answer. The Catholics she met were mostly poor workers, and when a Catholic lay dying, she always sent for a Catholic priest and prepared a little altar for them. Among the patients were Irishmen who had fallen off the scaffolding while building St. Patrick's Cathedral. One day, a young man who seemed to have broken all the bones in his body arrived at the hospital. He looked like a large white package and the nurses had to take his pulse on the finger sticking out from the bandages. 
Elizabeth heard him calling out, Mother, Mother, Holy Mary, Mother of God, help me, help Pat. He did not know, but in this way he was instructing a young Swedish nurse in the devotion to Our Lady, which was difficult for her to accept due to her Lutheran upbringing. Slowly, step by step, Elizabeth was led toward the Catholic Church. For example, she went several times to a convent to treat a Dominican nun who had a stiff arm. It did not require much work, so she had time to explore the place, and one day she went to the convent library and picked up a book on the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. When reading, she became amazed and thought, Why, this I have believed since I was a child. But her doubts continued. How could one pray to the Blessed Virgin and the saints? Was this not idolatry, she thought, taking away glory from God? A major breakthrough in Elizabeth Hesselblad's spiritual quest came when she was hired as a nurse in the wealthy Catholic family, the Cisneros. Her task was to take care of the sick mother, and she wrote to her parents about her difficult trip with her employers in 1897 to Colombia, where Mr. Cisneros had played a leading role in establishing the railway. We arrived here a week ago and having a most miserable time. My poor patient died the first night. Although we had waited for it during six months, it came as a surprise. You are never prepared for death. They have told me to stay, and it was Mrs. Cicerno's last wish. Just think how far away I am under the burning heat of the tropical sun. The two daughters Cisneros, Marie and Emma, hired Elizabeth to accompany them, and she became like another sister. The next year also Mr. Cisneros died, so the three girls were left to sort out the affairs of the family. They visited London, Elizabeth's family in Sweden, and went to Brussels. Marie and Emma invited Elizabeth to watch the Corpus Christi procession from the Cathedral of St. Gundula in Brussels. Elizabeth writes in her memoirs, The procession was returning to the cathedral, and we were standing on the high steps to see the bishop and priests enter with the blessed sacrament. I did not know that anything was carried by the bishop, but looked at the procession merely as I would look at an interesting military pageant, and seeing my two friends and most of the people go down on their knees, I slipped behind the big door so as not to offend those about me, and standing there I said, Before you, my God, do I kneel, but not here. By this time, the bishop carrying the monstrance had reached the door. My soul, so full of pain and struggle, was instantly filled with sweetness, and the gentle voice which seemed to come both from without and within my heart said, I am he whom you are seeking. I fell on my knees. After traveling through Europe, the Cisnero sisters and Elizabeth returned to the United States. The experience in Brussels was still strong in Elizabeth's mind. Whenever she passed a church where the Eucharist was kept, it was like a magnet drew her in, and she went right up to the altar rail, knelt and began to pray. Still, she was not ready to take the decisive step toward the Catholic Church. And when one of the Cisnero sisters decided to turn to a religious order, Elizabeth was filled with sorrow and thought. How is it possible that a religion that asks such heart-rending sacrifices can be the true one? Elizabeth even pleaded with the Jesuit priests to persuade her friend to return home. At the same time, she prayed to God in a way that made it clear that she was coming close to a decision. 
Still, my God, I only ask Thy will, Thy light to guide me. If it is Thy will that I should take this step and enter the Catholic Church, I plead with Thee to give a faith so strong that if the Pope in Rome and all the priests should leave the Church, I would still stand firm. One evening in 1902, when Elizabeth was working at a large hospital, a telegram came for her. She knew what news it contained without opening it. Her father had died. She continued to work despite her interior pain and regret that she had not been able to be at her father's deathbed. Two hours later, she retired to her room and cried. But as she knelt down on the floor, peace filled her soul. She held up her arms and said, Mary, my mother, I give him to you. Take him, O mother, and make him happy. Now I know your value, dearest mother. Nothing in life or death shall ever divide us. I am your child, Mary, my mother. After a long struggle, Elizabeth came to the conclusion that she needed to enter the Catholic Church. She went to Washington and asked to speak with the priest. It so happened that it was the same priest with whom she earlier had pleaded not to let her friend enter the convent. He directed her to another Jesuit, an astronomer, Father Hagen, who on learning of her strong faith agreed to her request. On the Assumption of Our Lady, August 15, 1902, Elizabeth was received into the Catholic Church. When receiving the conditional baptism, the Sister Cisneros stood on both her sides with lighted candles in their hands. While praying in the church, Elizabeth saw interiorly how everything in her life was swept away by a strong hand and only God remained. The only thing I saw, I felt, was God. My only desire was to do His holy will at any cost. In an instant, God's love was poured out over me. I understood that this love could only be answered by sacrifice, by a love ready to suffer for His glory, for His church. Without hesitation, I offered my life, my will, to follow him on the way of the cross. A few days later, Elizabeth left once again for Europe, now with only one of the Cisneros sisters. But when the boat reached the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, Hesse Blood's gastric ulcers opened up again and she bled for three days. People around her thought she was going to die, but she survived and stayed in a London hospital for six weeks to regain her strength. When Elizabeth could travel again, she went first to her family in Sweden and then to Rome. She looked forward to at last see the house of St. Bridget at Piazza Farnese. As she arrived at the piazza, she went into the convent church that now belonged to a Polish Carmelite order, and when kneeling in the pews, Elizabeth heard an interior voice saying, It is here I wish you to serve me. She became afraid that this was an illusion, but the more she prayed, the more she felt attracted to the church of St. Bridget, during the following days, it became increasingly clear to her that her life should be dedicated to the conversion of Sweden, her own and St. Bridget's home country. This insight overwhelmed her otherwise strong self-control and tears began to flow. 
During her remaining travels in Europe, Elizabeth several times heard the interior voice telling her, return to Rome, to St. Bridget's house. But she traveled to the United States as planned and immersed herself in charitable work. She put her experiences and ideas before Father Hagen, who had become her spiritual advisor. He answered, Your last letter was a genuine manifestation of conscience. It speaks loudly and clearly that you are called by providence to lead a higher life in a religious order. You may regard this question as settled. To what place you are called does not seem clear yet and will be the subject of our conversation and prayer. Elizabeth also began a correspondence with the Carmelites living in the house of St. Bridget in Rome, telling them of her inspirations. The superior, Mother Hedwig, invited her to come, but Elizabeth was still wondering if this was God's will and her interior bleedings resumed, so she had to stay at a nursing home for several months. She prayed to God. If it is your voice that bids me to go, give me only sufficient strength to rise from this bed, and I will go there to die for you and for my Protestant country. She had such a love to the Holy Spirit and this house in Rome that she had seen att hon ville dö i detta hus. Även vanlig svensk hade kanske velat återvända från USA till Sverige och dö i sitt fädernes land. Men hon var helt betagen och eh, hon fick ett jag. Och hon fick komma inte bara till ett, 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 ett rum i anslutning till klostret utan hon fick tillstånd att komma in i moderhuset med tillstånd att dö. It so happened that Elizabeths brother Ture who was a naval officer at this time was in the United States, and he agreed to accompany his sister to Europe. He was like a nurse to me. He held me up on deck each day and brought blankets with him to keep me warm, while I brought with me the catechism for him. And so we marched back and forth every day in our small part of the deck and spoke about God and the faith. The siblings arrived in Rome March 1904. After the intense travel catechism, Turia made the decision to convert to the Catholic Church while staying in Rome. The ceremony was performed in the church of St. Bridget's house, where Turia also received his first communion. But that his sister would enter a convent and that he would only speak with her through bars was difficult for him to accept and he pleaded with her not to enter, but she was determined. During the first five years in Rome, Elizabeth was still in bad health, but she was not inactive. She ordered thousands of printed pictures of St. Bridget and her daughter St. Catherine and sent them all over the world. She also spent much prayer time in the still-preserved room of St. Bridget in the house. She prayed for the conversion of the Scandinavian peoples, which she felt St. Bridget was prompting her to do. Finally, the superior mother Hedvig asked the Pope for special permission so that Elizabeth could be invested with the Bridgetian habit, as was her wish. It was granted, as it seemed, Elizabeth had not long to live. Just before the clothing, I knelt down to ask my Carmelite mother's blessing. She gave it to me and embraced me, saying, I give you back to St. Bridget and St. Catherine, who I thought had given you to me. Elizabeth Hesselblad was now the only Bridgeti nun in Rome. Moreover, she was living in a Carmelite convent, which was neither easy nor a long-term solution. She spent much time studying the history of the Bridgetine order and learning about the few remaining Bridgetine monasteries.
In 1908, she began to travel to them. Sion Abbey in England, Valladolid and Paredes de Nava in Spain, Alto Münster in Bavaria, and Uden and Wert in Holland. The purpose was to learn and to find support for establishing the Bridgetine Sisters in Rome and eventually in Sweden. When Elizabeth returned to Rome in 1911, Mother Hedwig had died and the new prioress did not allow her to stay inside the cloister. Instead, Elizabeth was given a temporary room in the guest house. Soon, however, with some financial help, she began to rent a six-room apartment but still in the house of St. Bridget. It was sufficient for a small community of Bridgetine sisters, but the old monasteries could not spare any. Instead, an English Catholic priest, Father Benedict Williamson, who knew Elizabeth and shared her zeal for the Bridgetine spirituality, came to her help. He mentioned Elizabeth's project in Rome to two pious girls in his parish, Catherine Flanagan and Amy Davis. They became interested and went to Rome in September 1911. In this way, Elizabeth Hesselblad became Mother Elizabeth and had her first two postulants, Sister Catherine and Sister Reginalda. Next year, two more came from England and then the Carmelites announced that they needed the apartment. The small community of Bridgetines therefore left the house of St. Bridget and moved instead to a house on Via Aurelia. It had been empty for several years and was in a bad shape, but after hard labor it was soon suitable to the needs of the sisters. In 1913, Pope Pius X gave Mother Elizabeth's small community's approval. The way was thus open for the postulants to become novices, and in 1915 they made their religious vows. Mother Elizabeth's health was as so often not good, but the community continued to grow. In her heart, the dream of reclaiming the house of St. Bridget for the Britain order was still strong. And in 1918, she pleaded her case with Pope Benedict XV during a private audience. She received a blessing, but no promise. As the community continued to grow, and the landlord wanted to use his house, the sisters moved again, now to a house on Via delle Isole. At this time, some Swedes approached Mother Elizabeth regarding buying the house at Piazza Farnese. So the interest in Sweden was growing for the idea, and in 1923, Mother Elizabeth received an invitation to go to Sweden for the 550th anniversary of the death of St. Bridget. Mother Elisabeth Hesseblad came to Sweden 1923 on the invitation of SSB, Societa Sancte Birgitte, a community that was founded in 1920 and they wanted to celebrate the 550th anniversary of the death of St. Birgitte's death. Och eftersom en av grundarna, Mary von Rosen, har träffat moder Elisabeth i Rom och kände till henne. Och kände till Birgittas systrarna, deras lilla gemenskap i Rom. Så tyckte hon att man kunde bjuda in henne att delta tillsammans med en annan syster. The morning after the jubilee celebration of St. Bridget in Vastena, a small group sneaked into the old abbey church, the Blue Church. The Catholic priest, Monsignor Berndt Assasson, secretly celebrated there the first Catholic Mass since the 16th century. Sister Reginalda writes in her diary. We left the house where we stayed at half past four in the morning. It was already light. We carried bundles with things necessary for the Mass and saw the spire of our beloved church. Before five o'clock, Count von Rosen arrived with the key. 
It was a moving sight in the quiet morning hour. The sacred words of the priest echoed in the nave and the transept. At this, the atmosphere at once changed. The once cold and desolated sanctuary was filled with a richness that no human words can describe. The mass in the blue church was highly symbolic. Mother Elizabeth was determined to bring the Brillatine order not only to Rome, but also back to Sweden. But convents and monasteries were still prohibited by law, so what could she do? There was a new bishop, Bishop Müller, who had been elected to his office on the year 1923. Moder Elisabeth och han de hade träffats i Rom så att de kände varandra. Han kände till hennes planer och han hjälpte henne när hon kom hit på sommaren 1923. Hon själv ville ju att systrarna skulle komma till Vastena. Det som är ordens ursprung. Men eh, biskopen ansåg att det var för tidigt. Katolska kyrkan i Sverige hade inte resurser att hjälpa systrarna i Vastena. Så han sa nej till det. Han ansåg det var bättre att systrarna var någonstans i Stockholmstrakten. Han hade en del förslag, men eh, moder Elisabeth var inte på samma linje som biskopen. Nu var det så att hennes bror Gustav bodde här i Djursholm, någonstans i närheten. Han tipsade moder Elisabeth om att den här fastigheten var till, till Salu. Eh, hon kom hit och tittade på den och det föll henne i smaken. Det var rätt. Så att den 10 september 1923 kunde hon underteckna det här köpekontraktet på fastigheten. Nu var det ju så att 1923 så var fortfarande den här klosterparagrafen gällande. Den innebar att katolska kloster inte fick grundas i Sverige. Alltså grundade hon Sankta Birgittas vilohem. Och på det sättet kom hon förbi. Hon kunde runda den här paragrafen. Naturligtvis, vi vet ju att det var ett kloster, en klosterkommunitet. Men för att kunna återföra orden till Sverige var hon tvungen att göra så. Ja, så började ett litet klosterliv här. After completing the Swedish foundation, Mother Elizabeth returned in 1924 to Rome and took up with new determination the struggle to acquire the house of St. Bridget at Piazza Farnese. After that, she built the first little community of Birgitinsystrar 20 år innan hon kunde köpa huset. Och det var med stora uppoffringar och förutmjukelse på, på den vägen innan hon fick den möjligheten. Ja, det hade ju Helga Birgitta bott i 20, ja, 19 år in, innan, fram till hennes död. Hon kom ju till Rom 1349 och bodde först på en annan plats i fem år. Men, men därefter fick hon ju till skänks. Bodde där med sin dotter Helga Katarina sina två biktfäder och ett svenskt ett sällskap av nära vänner och pilgrimer. Och hennes hus var ju alltid öppet för svenska pilgrimer som kom ner till Rom. Och det är en tradition som har bevarats i huset genom alla århundraden. Det har varit ett Sverigehus i Rom kan man säga för svenskar. Hennes rum och hela Katarinas rum har ju bevarats som ett sanktuarium under alla århundraden oavsett vem som förvaltat huset, olika påvar kardinaler, ordnar och kongregationer och därför har de här rummen haft en mycket stor betydelse. Ja, Helge Birgitta fick ju de allra flesta av sina över 700 uppenbarelser, alltså det vill säga det var över 600 uppenbarelser i detta rum som finns bevarat där. Det är ett mycket heligt andligt rum som är bevarat där och också heliga Katarinas rum som nu är ett aktivt kapell också för Birgitta orden för oss som bor där. Vi kan alltid gå in där och be och ha våra andliga mödrars närvaro i vårt dagliga liv. Och, och det här visste ju givetvis heliga moder Elisabeth. Och det var också i dessa rum som hon eh, avgav sina första löften och eh, nygrundade 
sin nya gren av heliga Birgitinorden med den första lilla kommuniteten som kom dit 1911. Så de har en mycket historisk och viktig roll i Birgitinordens historia. Inte minst då eftersom heliga Birgitta också hade sin himmelska födelsedag i detta rum. Så det är en viktig plats. On April 8, 1930, after many donations and help from the Vatican, Mother Elizabeth Hesselblad at last received the keys to the house of St. Bridget. Now she had managed, against all odds, while suffering from a severe lifelong sickness, to re-establish the Bridgetine order in Sweden, Stockholm, and in the house of St. Bridget in Rome. It was an astonishing feat of willpower, cooperating with grace. However, the final piece was still missing for reclaiming the heritage of St. Bridget, Vastena, the site of the original mother convent and the cultural heart of late medieval Swedish Catholicism. The law against monasteries was still in place, so as in Stockholm, where she had established a nursing home in 1923, Mother Elizabeth established a retreat center in Vastena, close to the old abbey church. 35 grundade Moder Elisabeth äntligen hennes önskan med klostret i Vastena. Hon kallade dit Moder Katarina Flanagan som var en av de första systrarna. Hon skriver Katarina var den första som trädde över tröskeln i Birgittas rum 1911. Hon kom till Vastena som första priorinna. On the eve of the Second World War, Mother Elizabeth Hesselblad had fulfilled the mission that she worked so hard for during almost three decades. The tree of Bridgetine spirituality was once again planted both in Rome and in Sweden, and it was bearing fruit in a new unexpected way on several continents, particularly in India. When the war ended, Mother Elizabeth was 75 years old. She would live another 12 years, but became increasingly frail and confined to her bed during the 1950s. Finally, in April 24, 1957, she lay dying in the house of St. Bridget, as she had done more than 50 years earlier. When she then had received permission from Pope Pius X, to wear the Bridgetine habit, as she was supposedly terminally ill, he had jokingly said to her, but do not forget to die. Now she was ready to make good on that promise. The Swedish author Anna-Lena Ellström wrote 1957 in the Swedish Catholic magazine Credo. During her death struggle, one of Mother Hesselblad's most faithful sisters burst out. What are we supposed to do without you, Mother? What she whispered as an answer could have been her life motto. I will help you. I will help you. During her life, so full of work, toil and sickness, of problems and difficulties, but also victories and incredible prayer responses, she had learned that for God nothing was impossible. As she so often wrote at the end of her letters, Inte domine speravi, non confundar in eternum. 